think. <laughs> I think I may have. Okay. Oh, oh my gosh. I think I figured out how to do it. <laughs> it's the first time in a long time that I haven't had like annoying issues. There we go. Okay. I haven't had annoying issues with stupid. Anyway. Hey. Hey, hey, hey. Yeah, I haven't had annoying issues with, you know, the old uh, social media sites giving me some hassle about like, are you sure? How do you do this? So anyway. Okay. Welcome. Welcome to some live office hours here on Friday, the um, 3rd of March. Okay. My name is Dr. Shadow Coates. <laughs> I don't know why my voice went up like that when I said that. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> Hi! Mm. Uh, yeah, and uh, my pronouns, hey Jennifer, my pronouns are um, she, her, they, them, and I am coming to you live from a little town that is uh, north of Toronto in Ontario, Canada, and these are the traditional lands of the Haudenosaunee. The Anishinaabeweke, the Mississauga, and the Wendake Neo Wenseo peoples. Hey, Sarah. Ooh, hey. Oh, I like it when there's some France happening here too. That's amazing. Well, yeah. So recently, in the last, uh, if you read the post that I posted a couple days ago, maybe it was yesterday. Maybe I posted it yesterday. I don't remember. Um, recently. Um, in the last, let's say the last like two, three weeks, I know, right? Sorry, I don't know. Time is a construct. Who knows? Who knows? Uh, this concept of if you can sing classical, you can sing anything, slash, classical technique is the best technique for like all styles, slash, classical technique is the is what we should be teaching. I kind of came up in a in a in a bunch of different venues, a, diff, a, a bunch of different ways. Um, and I haven't seen that in in a while. Like I haven't seen that kind of concept uh, in quite a while, actually. And maybe that's just a function of who I'm hanging out with these days. Who knows? But maybe also the culture has changed. In in who knows? Who knows why? But like I said, so I was a little bit surprised because I was like, oh. There's that old chestnut <laughs> coming in. Interesting. Um, and I hadn't seen it in a while, like I said. So, yeah, the surprise. So I was like, okay. So, and I was sort of examining for myself a little bit, thinking about my reaction to the various different people who had said this thing or a variation on this thing of, like, classical technique being the, like, foundational technique slash if you can sing classical you can sing anything kind of thing so like i was kind of examining my reaction and noticing that my reaction was slightly different to the various different people and avenues through which this had come and so i was like that is figure that is fascinating because my my always my initial reaction and I think I feel like it's possible that my initial reaction to this as a bald statement just out in the wild classical technique is the best foundation slash if you can sing classical you can sing anything etc etc is no <laughs> that's my initial right like this statement like sort of out in the wild is like no and at the same time one of the folks that that came to me through, I did not have that sort of like, oh, no, <laughs> let's talk. I did not have that reaction um, because their definition and the way we were using, mm, no, <laughs> the way they were using classical technique was actually, and also this is a, a relatively young teacher, relatively new teacher, um, was, was, they were using classical technique as a stand-in for like functional technique. 
they were using it as a stand-in for some other things. And so I was, I just thought that was, it was fascinating. So I just kind of wanted to like have this discussion. <laughs> and when I posted about it, there were lots and lots of folks like, you know, also having the discussion, which I think is fantastic. And I, I yes. So let me, let me, I would love, there is, oh gosh, here we go. I can say it. I'm a, there are lots of folks like myself who have had extensive Western classical training. So um, I have a whole bunch of performance degrees in Western classical training, right? So, uh, and I did not have a career per se. However, I am more than passingly aware of, of what Western classical uh, technique um, sounds like, looks like, what it takes to train uh, toward that technique. And also, um, thank you. And also, you know, I have a more than passing familiarity with what, uh, um, shall I say appropriate? I'm not sure appropriate. What, what um, efficient, useful, Western classical technique looks like. So what the outcome of that is. So I have a more than passing um, understanding and experience with what the sounds of Western classical singing are and are not, and a very strong, uh, <laughs> lots, um, um, again, more than passing experience with what those coordinations are like and how to create those coordinations and also working with singers who are creating those coordinations. So for me, classical technique has a very specific, very specific um, meaning. And when I use Western classical technique, when I say Western classical technique, I have a very specific understanding of what that is, right? Very specific. And also, of, and, I, and I love Western classical singing. I love opera. I'm, I love singing opera. I love singing art song. I mean, I love it. So the, that's all good, right? Like I'm not, I don't hate it. And I had um, some wonderful experiences uh, in my training and some wonderful voice teachers. So like, all good. And that is my uh, my very specific understanding, right? And there are lots of folks like me out there who have had that, and lots of voice teachers out there who have had that very specific, who have that kind of very specific understanding of what classical technique means and the application of classical technique. I'm not all the big quotes here, but classical technique. And that tends to mean if you've had that kind of training and that kind of experience, that tends to mean that we are working on a specific kind of uh, coordination or sets of coordinations, if you will. <laughs> coordinations has become this noun, which it actually, <laughs> spell check doesn't like it when I put an S on coordinations because they're like, it's not a noun. And I'm like, oh yes, <laughs> it is now. You're welcome. So it's become this sort of like, a bunch of very specific coordinations that require quite a lot of learning. They're quite complex. They require a lot of learning in order to create the tonal outcomes that are going to be heard uh, throughout the pitch range on every vowel without amplification in a hall. And in order for that to be true, in order to be heard, in order for all of those parameters around what we consider Western classical singing to be, in order for all of those parameters to be true, again, there's a very specific set of coordinations that need to happen in order for that to be true for, um, you know, for a singer who is singing in that, in that style. And the training or the technique that goes along with that that is a very specific, again, that's a very specific kind of training. Um, yes, Sarah, exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes, Sarah, okay, yeah, I'm gonna read that comment in just a second, exactly that. So we have this like classical technique that is this very specific like 
set of coordinations that leads to a very specific tonal outcome or tonal outcomes. And, and the way that we are heard on Amplified is by having a very specific shaping, is by lining up, you know, registration, by, you know, there's like acoustic stuff, registration, blah, blah, blah. There's lots and lots of stuff that's involved in that. And also there is a very specific release of breath that is required and, a, and a specific um, coordinations with breath and phonation, as well as lining up vocal track shaping and all that stuff, right? So there's a whole bunch of things that are very specific to us being able to be heard on Amplified over an orchestra, over or with a chorus, in a hall, et cetera, et cetera. And so all of those coordinations lead toward this tonal, this very specific tonal outcome. All right, so we have this definition in our heads. I, specifically, and people who have had the, a similar training to mine have that definition in our heads of classical technique. And then we also have folks who perhaps haven't had that same amount of, of training in that way and who perhaps haven't gone all the way to the sort of like end of of that training. So folks who have done, um, you know, who did classical singing in high school, for example, um, along with say music theater or in pop or whatever, or who did uh, in, in Canada, who did uh, Royal Conservatory music exams, right? So you learned some of the aspects of the style and some of the ways that we coordinate in order to create those tonal outcomes. We learned some of them. We didn't go all the way to the end of them necessarily. And uh, we and so and often in those cases, as well as in, in, in the case of me who has done a lot of that training, often in those cases, what happens is we have sort of downloaded this idea that classical training, and this isn't in all cases, but we sort of download this idea that classical training and classical technique is a way to sing in like head voice, for example, is associated with, for, for folks who have had a, an estrogen influenced um, puberty, it's a way to learn how to sing in head voice, like we use our head voice in, in classical technique. And it's a way to have a loftier sound, right? We, we find these different kind of tonal outcomes and it's a way to find options for other kinds of tonal outcomes. So we understand classical technique in a slightly different way. We understand classical technique to be a thing that gives me some options for using head voice or using an ooh vowel in a certain way or for using, you know, I don't know, uh, oh, a legato, etc. So, yes, yeah, yeah, yes, Daniel, exactly, that too, that too. So we also, and exactly what you're saying there too, Daniel, so like we also then associate it with classical technique with this like, there is a set of parameters that are already out there and I have to learn how to fit my voice into those parameters. I have to learn the correct coordinations in order to create these, in order to be part of these parameters. Oh. Sarah's saying, yes, I thought I was broken because my head voice was so light and almost breathy, and I thought I should have the same resonance as my chest voice. Yes. So we associate these things with, like, classical technique. It gets further complicated because we also then start to associate classical technique with the right way to sing the healthy way to sing, the most, you know, efficient way to sing, the morally superior way to sing, <laughs> the high art way to sing, right? The sophisticated way to sing, the cultured way to sing. So we start, it gets more complicated. All of this kind of gets even more complicated because there are all these layers of morality and shooting and healthy and, you know, frankly, racism and like colonialism and all, like there are all these layers, all of these other layers get kind of glommed onto what does classical technique mean? 
So this word, or this thing takes on this like, all of these dimensions around like, what is classical technique? And it kind of becomes then, it often then becomes this like bludgeon, right? It becomes this like thing that we use to sort of bludgeon people with, <laughs> where we're like, uh, where we're like, well, you have to learn classical technique because it is like the healthiest singing. It's the best coordination. You're all, you know, like if you can sing with that kind of singing, then you can use, you know, then you'll you'll be sure not to hurt yourself in any other style. Like you can branch off from the things you learn in classical. Yeah, it's weaponized. Exactly. Weaponized classical technique. Exactly. Exactly. Yes, I totally think that, Jennifer. So. Jennifer says, would you agree that as we move away from master apprentice and towards student-led lessons, this definition of classical is best may also be diminished? I absolutely do think that. Um, I think it's all coming, I think there's there's so much coming together with that, you know, like there's so much coming together with like student-led learning, understanding, you, uh, understanding that cla Western classical technique tends to be a, here's the thing you have to do, here's how you have to get to it, like here are the parameters, here's what your sound has to sound like, and so I'm gonna train you to sound like that. Um, as we start to sort of move away from that, even in Western classical singing, right? So even in even that training, we start to move away from that a little bit. I also, yeah, I think, I think it's coming from both sides. As we start to recognize, yes, yes, Sarah as well. As we empower the voice of students in lessons, we lose that top down and we use their language, not ours. Yeah, so I think it's coming from both sides, both from the like, I wanna support my students and uh, student-led learning uh, philosophy, and from the like, wait a minute, Western classical technique has this whole parameter of things that you have to sound like, and so I don't, but I don't need to actually do if I don't actually want to sound like that, then I don't need to actually do the things that need me to sound like that, right? Hmm. Interesting how that works. Yeah. So, um, yes, yeah, exactly. Um, let me come back a little bit to right. So then the other thing that happens, which Sarah, I'm just coming to you, coming back to this as well. Yeah, it, it, I I feel like it's sort of coming from both sides. The other thing that happens with this like classical technique is good, blah, 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 is we also then morph a little bit into, or what has happened, and is that we sort of morph a little bit into, well, classical technique is actually functional. So we take off the label of Western classical technique and we say, well, it's functional, right? Like these are just efficient ways to learn how to use your voice and if, and efficient coordinations for your voice. And so that just makes it functional technique. And the issue comes in when in the back of our little minds, we have not yet confronted our bias, our Western classical bias, where we say, where we're saying, oh no, it's functional. But what we mean is it's the best because it's Western classical. <laughs> Right? So we're like, oh no, I don't, it's not, I'm not teaching Western classical technique. I'm just teaching functional um, technique, right? I'm just teaching like functional. But really, we haven't done the work to be like, is this actually functional for what the singer wants to do with their voice? Is this actually what the singer wants to do with their voice? Because the only functional technique is the technique that will allow the singer to do what they want to do with their voice. That's the only functional technique, right? Do we want to provide options? Sure, absolutely. But like, that's, if I'm, if I am deciding what the options are, I'm still in charge, right? So what, it, what do we mean by functional? Yes, Sarah, functional is a totally loaded term as well. <laughs> absolutely. And, it, and, and, it, and, and, all words are loaded, right? Like they're all, this is the problem where we're trying to use words to explain things, but, and words are great, but they're also terrible. <laughs> so, so we get this sort of like people who, when they're saying classical technique is the best technique, if you can sing classical, you can sing anything. When what they mean is functional technique. In other words, the technique that you 
that will allow you to sing in the way you want to sing. And because we've been handed down this like legacy that classical is the best, I'm saying, I'm using classical to describe the thing that I think is the best because classical is the word that I think is going to be the right descriptor for the thing that is the best, which it isn't actually. Oh gosh, hopefully that wasn't too crazy, like too like, <laughs> too squirrely. Sarah says, so interesting, classical technique as a glossary for functional technique, exactly as opposed to style. This is exactly what happens. I'm a CCM person who's totally taught the idea of bel canto as just good functional technique. Yes, this is what happens, right? So bel canto, again, gets this like, it's the uber classical technique, right? Like it's the, it's the best, it's the uber thing. We should all be trying to, you know, work toward bel canto. First of all, I don't really even really know what bel canto means. Like, I don't know, anyway. <laughs> That's a whole other thing. <laughs> we don't need to get into that. If you want to kind of get into Bel Canto, read James Stark's incredibly dense tome called Bel Canto. Wait, is that what it's called? I think it's over there somewhere. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's behind a book. I can't see what it's called. Anyway, James Stark, if you're interested. Um, oh... I used to be self-conscious about being ridiculed by colleagues using terminology that teens and young adults understood instead of pedagogish. Yes, we get caught up in using like our singing teacherese, right? And so often our singing teacherese is based on bel canto equals beautiful voice. End of argument. Yeah, like, who, but like also who gets to decide what beautiful means? <laughs> um, so like James Stark, bel canto, that's a book. You can do the thing we get caught up in singeries. And so often our singing teacherese or our pedagogy ease is based on this is based on our like Western classical elitism where we're like, well, this technique is the best. And so you're not gonna get hurt if you use this technique. And so also then it must be functional because it's the best, right? Okay. Um, my experience, where are we, where are we? Uh, as a general rule, my experience is that classical singing is often find functional sounds is often about yeah finding functional sounds and then using them as a color palette when singing for pop rock etc it often feels like we express and find colors first and then figure out the functional ways to make those sounds yeah absolutely i think that is uh and i think that is also a fundamental difference in how we work with those two uh populations as well right and the understanding of what it means to be a uh, you know popular music singer um versus what it means to be like a western classical singer there's a parameter versus what kind of sounds are you going to make intuitively in order to communicate in the way you want to and then how can we make those sounds as easy and efficient for you as possible that's the functional technique um yes 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 and i wanted to get into weaponized classical technique well so that's the other thing too what then starts to happen is i as for example perhaps as a um a pop singer or a music theater singer or someone who uh let, let's just say a pop singer music theater singer i go on like late night with david letterman <laughs> which Gosh, that was a that was an old reference. I go on a talk show, and they're like, "Well, you're so amazing," and I say, "Well, yeah. I mean, I ha I did have Western, I did have classical training, you know, and I use that classical training as a way to legitimize how great I am right now and how well I use my voice right now, because it's sort of like in the zeitgeist that like classical training is like the best technique, right? So, well, I do, I did learn classical technique, you know." I did train as a classical singer. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You don't need to use classical technique to justify or validate the way you're singing right now. You're singing right now as a pop singer. Maybe you use some of the coordinations that you learned in your, in, in your Western classical technique training. But like, if you, unless you train to the nth degree to be like a classical opera singer, I bet that the coordinations that you're using were really just like how to do a little bit more efficient breathing. And that doesn't necessarily mean that you are actually, 
you know, doing that full Western classical degree. But like, who cares? You don't need it to justify or rationalize or validate your singing now. You just don't, unless you actually were an opera singer. And yeah, whatever, we're gonna talk about that. I feel like even functional or healthy singing is negotiable for our students. It depends on what they're trying to accomplish. If singing that's less sustainable is also serving a p purpose of self-expression and catharsis, sometimes that's more important. I 100% agree, Daniel. I, I, and also, like, uh, my feeling is that classical technique training doesn't provide the musicality skills for jazz and music theater, etc. cetera. Uh, musicality is a separate thing. Like, that's a, that's a separate, and to a certain extent, I agree. Yeah, uh, I, 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 yeah, to a certain ex extent, I agree with that, yeah. That's a separate, I, I, I'm not gonna talk, let's not talk about musicality. Let's just talk about, like, singing and coordination. <laughs> Otherwise, we'll be here for, like, hours. <laughs> let's not be here for hours. Um, so, functional and healthy singing negotiable for students. I 100% agree. I also think that, uh, so, like, what do you, what do you need to do now in the moment to do the thing that you need to do? And... How sustainable do you need your voice to be? Like, how sustainable do you? Uh, how sustainable does this sound need to be? So, someone like I don't know Axl Rose, I don't know John Bon Jovi, I don't know. Anyway, some folks who folks who have these long careers singing in ways that are unhealthy does it matter? I don't know. It's sustainable, so then it's functional. I don't know. Could it be easier, perhaps? I don't know. Um, and sometimes, yeah, by functional, I mean there are limited things one can do. High larynx, low larynx, more pressure, less pressure, high flow, low flow, convergent, divergent, broad bells, dark bells. Oh, yeah, I, I hear you, uh, Sven. I think, I think that we have, I think people who are thinking about it <laughs> are thinking about, okay, what do I actually mean by functional, right? Like, do I mean like, uh, uh, you know, like what, what's the actual function of the instrument and then what is gonna be useful for the singer in front of me? And also how do we explore the functions, right? Like how do we explore like high larynx, low larynx, more pressure, less pressure, like those explorations where we find the things that are the most efficient, functional for the singer in front of us for the tonal outcomes that they wanna make. So those th that exploration is part of functional, I think as well, right, uh, Sven? I absolutely think that's part of it. Um, Yes. So that's the one hand is that I had classical training becomes a validation for the way I'm singing right now, which you don't need that validation. Why? Let it go. Say I, I had some training and I've got some good options for my training. Great. The other thing that happens on the other side of that is it becomes weaponized, um, as we were talking about earlier, right? So classical singing becomes weaponized where we have like this, um, uh, uh, well, you didn't have classical training and so you aren't a good singer, which happens quite a lot. Where, uh, and some of the folks in the comments were talking about that too. I, hopefully that's changing. Hopefully that is changing. But um, some of the folks, let me just grab some of the comments here, um, which I loved. Uh, my phone went off while I was talking. Oh, look, there I am talking. <laughs> oh. Someone said, uh, Amanda says, it's hard, it's a hard no for me. <laughs> I get bothered when people swing that lie as a means to shut down the exploration of other types of techniques that may be contrary to what they've learned and lived. Yes, yes, exactly. So the, that, it become, it, they swing that lie, right? It becomes weaponized. Well, if you're not doing classical technique or if you aren't doing classical training, then aha, and where you got it is a whole other thing too, right? Then you, you're you not doing good training or you're not doing good singing or it's inherently unhealthy, bad singing. Uh, and functional is skirting a line of habilitation, rehabilitation. I don't think we want to confuse the intent if we're naming things as functional. Yeah, that's true, Sarah. Yeah, yeah I hadn't actually thought about it that way too. Yep, we can definitely be skirting uh, that line for sure. Yep. Uh, says, so yes, and where you got your classical training? Whole other thing too. Lineage comes in like hard, <laughs> so hard, <laughs> and then we get to be judgy about that too, right? <laughs> well, if you didn't study with that, you studied with so and so. They didn't. They don't have bel canto training. 
Yeah, we get we get we get honored by that. So Christy says, um, curious when dealing with young people, is there a responsibility for safeguarding learned coordinations because of the likelihood their intentions could change for how sustainable their singing needs uh, could be? Oh, that's a really good question. So I think, um, just off the top of my head, Christy, I think that the responsibility is to um, is to provide options. So their intent in terms of what they want to, what they, how they want to sing, um, and what kind of sounds they want to put out in the world. I know the question's amazing, right? I don't know. Uh, their intention, absolutely. I mean, my intention changed. <laughs> So like lots of people's, right? Our intention changes, right? So yeah, absolutely. So I think our responsibility, I'm not like a huge fan of like safeguard, like the idea of safeguard, like as as, as educators. I, I totally understand where you're coming from, Chrissy. I absolutely understand. But I'm also like not a fan of that. The concept of like where that comes from in terms of like, oh, I need to be sort of like um, in charge of like making sure they're safe kind of thing um, in, in this sense what I prefer is like the idea of we're working with options. So here, here are the options. So if you are in an option, like if you, here are your, here are the options. Let's find the options for your most ease, most efficient singing that will give you the option to sing the things you want to sing right now. And also, Let's work so that you are self-assessing, you are able to self-assess, you are working on agency in terms of like, what is happening in my voice? What do I like? What don't I like? What is, uh, what feels efficient? What doesn't feel efficient? How does it feel when it's free? How does it feel when it's not free? What are the things that I can change? Understanding what tools I have at my disposal. I think that is our, our, our role. So rather than safeguarding, we give them the keys to it, right? We give them the options so that then when they do, uh, because I think it's inevitable, when they do change, yeah, what are all the sounds I can make with my voice right now? And, and what are the ways I can make it, right? What are my options? And then when they do change, they're also like, they, can, they have also the options to change. And they also have the tools, if you will, um, Oh yeah, Liz is saying the same thing. <laughs> they also have the tools, if you will, to be able to make the decisions for themselves about what is sustainable long-term, right? And, and what those trade-offs are for them and how they can find. And also, when we work that way as a coach, like when we work that way toward that like long-term sustainability, uh, uh, toward them understanding their own long-term sustainability and agency, when we work that way, they're gonna come back to us not like when, when something changes or when they can't figure it out themselves, right? Yeah, 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 exactly. They'll have different instruments, but they're gonna come back to us not because they need you to, not because they need us to tell them whether or not they're singing healthily or safely, right? They're, they're not gonna come back to us, but they're gonna come back to us because they want a co-conspirator in their voice. And they know that you are supporting them and you're going to be there to be excited about supporting them to find their most efficient um, functional coordinations that's going to work for them now for their desired tonal outcomes um, and also they then can make that decision based on the information that they have because they are able to self-assess whether this is sustainable for me or not this actually doesn't feel sustainable they understand within their own bodies what is sustainable for them or what is more tense than they would like it to be or more effort than they would like it to be or just plain isn't working however they want it to work right so they're once they're able to do that self-assessment like that's our goal is to like support them to be able to do that self-assessment and then they come back or they go to another teacher yeah sarah's saying and someday they won't be our student and we want them to be empowered with all of the tools <laughs> Um, and I'm just going to read Liz's comment because yes, what if the responsibility is to help students learn to learn, to give them the tools to identify for themselves when they are engaging in expensive, yes, vocal technique for a specific, specific expressive purpose. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Love that. Um, functional singing in the classical world is institutionalized. Yeah, I think there's a lot of that as well. Functional singing outside of classical is more piecemeal. You have to look a little harder to find where that training is happening. Um, yeah. Yeah, I wouldn't disagree with that, um, Daniel. I wouldn't. I wouldn't disagree with that at all. Um, 
uh, there's there's certainly I mean that's the nature of the uh, of the of, aca uh, of the academy right like that's the nature of the institution <laughs> is to formalize and institutionalize and to create uh, you know like a body around or a you know a set of rules around what a thing is supposed to be that's the nature of the institution so of course within the, that system there are going to be people who are who are um, who are working in a, in a different way within the institution. And of course, there are lots of people who um, are also taking that kind of like institutionalization into, right? <laughs> They're taking that institutionalization into the voice studio as well, into their, into the, um, yeah, into the voice studio. So let me also say too, there, there are some things here, uh, you know, and there are lots of folks commenting about their personal experience with like having that Western classical training and then feeling that they need to unlearn so many of the things that they learned in order to have to use their voice effectively for other styles. Um, and, and that is, I mean, that Sarah also may come back to what you were saying earlier, Sarah Rose, where you were saying like classical technique, meaning, uh, uh, style versus like classical being a style versus a whole technique. I think that's what you're saying there, but um, where so, and, and also this kind of ties into cross training, if you will, where so much of what we are learning in, when we're learning in that Western, when we're learning in Western classical institutions, we're learning in a, that kind of more top down, here's what you need to know. And so I'm going to get you to that. So we, here are the parameters. Um, when we're learning in that, in that way, so often then what happens is we internalize this very specific coordination, these very specific coordinations. And then the body does not learn the other options, right? We don't know the other options because those other options were never offered and were, and in fact, maybe were like disparaged as being not good because we had to learn, you know, we have to learn these art songs. And so we've got to, you know, you have a jury. <laughs> so we've got to work on, you know, your stuff for your jury. So, and you've got to sound right for the jury, right? So those sounds, become sort of enshrined in the body and so then then there is a literal unlearning as people are saying right and and it can feel resentful you can feel a little resentful lots of folks i know feel resentful about like having to unlearn some things because they were never offered options in their um training style versus technique because let's be honest yes uh-huh 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 yeah yeah Christy says, I like the verbiage style versus technique because let's be honest about the fact that so many who identify under the classical technique umbrella do not agree about lots of huge things. Yeah, it's so true. I know, it's so true. So what happens though when we have effective cross-training? So let me put a very large caveat here about cross-training. The vast majority of popular music styles do not need to be cross-trained because what we assume when we, so often what we assume when we are doing cross-training is we assume, notice all the quotes, whoa, so many quotes, um, is we assume that we, that again, I am as the teacher, I'm the final arbiter of the sound and or I know what you should sound like, and or I am going to be the person who teaches you how to do these sounds. And now I'm teaching you this sound and this sound, and I've decided that those are the two, I'm gonna say two, but those are the two kinds of sounds that you need to know, right? So when we talk about cross-training, often, we're still getting a whole flavor of basically that Western classical elitism in there, right? Or we're getting that whole flavor of top-down teaching in there. We're getting that whole flavor of not student-led teaching in there. So just that's my caveat. Because in popular music styles, when they're training in popular music styles, uh, oh, good question, Charlotte. Let me come back to that. When we're training in specific 
Uh huh. And Daniel's saying this too. There's a difference between I know what you want and I know how to help you get what you want. Yeah, there's absolutely a difference between those two, 100%. And so often, when, so when we're working with popular music styles, when we're working with popular music singers, as we've already kind of referred to, the cross training isn't about like, here are these two, or the, here are these two kind of separate opposite options, right? Divergent versus convergent kind of vocal track shaping, right? Like we talk about those two, like whatever. When we're working with popular music singers, as we've already kind of alluded to, what we're doing is, how do you want to sound? What do you want to say? How does your body respond when you want to say that thing? How can I help you? How can I support you? I'm trying to change out help with support. How can I support you on your journey to figuring out the most efficient and or what your options are on your journey to figuring out how you want to sing, right? So like those are all of those and along the way, I might suggest that we do some things that sound a little bit more classical that we explore some other classical sounds, or that we explore some of these sounds, whatever kinds of other sounds, so that you have options that you can kind of dip into and bring into the fore when you want to. That's popular music's training. And to me, the cross training option has just a little bit more of the like, again, you're not really in charge of this thing, Oh yeah, there's also such a dissonance to carry as students also come to us as industry experts. Yes, Sarah. Oh my gosh, that's a whole other big can of worms, which maybe maybe I'll touch on, let's see. Um, when we talk about cross-training, the vast majority of folks who talk about cross-training are Western classical singers who are like, and I'm gonna, and teachers, right? And academia who are like, we're gonna do cross training, which means you're gonna be able to sing all the styles. And what they mean is you're gonna be able to do music theater and classical. That's what they mean, right? Yeah, and that too. Cross training gives the impression that styles are wholly and entirely separate. Exactly, that too. So what they mean is like you're gonna you're gonna have all the skills you need to be a Western classical singer and a music theater singer. Music theater and Western classical have parameters they both do music theater has parameters it has parameters you have to be able to be understood even if you're singing grunge in a grunge musical grunge style real grunge style probably not going to be able to understand much of what you're saying mm -hmm. that's part of the style that's part of the if you of the style right you don't get to understand half of what i'm saying because i'm just kind of grungy I'm doing a grunge. If I'm doing a grunge musical, you still have, you have to understand my diction has to be good. Good. I have to, you have to understand what I'm saying because it's a musical. There are parameters around musical theater that are that we that lead us to teach toward that thing and to teach the thing and to get folks to go into the, you know, to learn the thing that we think they need to know in order to sing the thing. So cross training, I love the concept of it. I think it's flawed. I think it's flawed. <laughs> and I think it's no mistake. I think it's not, um, I think it's not, I find that we only have to have these conversations with people who have been through a Western classical, exactly Rebecca. That's why I think it's so flawed, right? Folks with different backgrounds don't even need the cross training conversation. One. 100% Rebecca that is exactly what I'm trying to say the 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 folks the only folks who are having these conversations about cross training and how valuable cross training is are the folks who are like in western classical and we're saying oops we need to give more like people need more options so how about if i decide what those options are going to be for you <laughs> how about if i do the cross training yes so I think, again, I love the concept of it. I understand where it's coming from. We want to give singers options, absolutely. And I think it's flawed. I think there's a flawed logic there. And I also think, 
I wonder why it's only the academic women. <laughs> Not only, but I wonder why it's primarily the Western classical singers and trainers who are talking about cross training. Fascinating. And then I think as this comes down into independent voice studios, which is my jam, what I love, when we get into independent voice studios, do we even need to talk about cross training? Well, again, the only, the only independent voice teachers who are talking about cross training are the ones who are like trained in Western classical singing and who are like, oh, I need to offer these other options. I know I need to make sure that my, the singers I work with are like well-rounded musicians. Lots and lots of independent voice teachers are like, here, <laughs> Christy. <laughs> yes, let's be more free. Here's a foot longer slack on the leash. <laughs> yes, everyone can be freer. Here's more. Here's a longer rope. <laughs> You're welcome. Yes, exactly. Jennifer said, no, we're not cross training. We're just training. Yeah. So if some of the options that we're offering in the voice studio and if someone expresses to us in the voice studio independent voice teacher right if if in an independent voice studio if a singer comes in and says i want to be an opera singer amazing let's talk about what that means in terms of options right let's talk about it so then we start to you know we start to build up these goals between the two of us we have like okay here are some of the what are the skills you're going to need what are the sounds you're going to need to be able to create in order to be an opera singer let's talk about these sounds let's talk about these coordinations let's get these coordinations learned no problem at all at the same time i'm not doing cross training i'm also saying at the same time if you were to sing this this and this what other stuff do you love to sing let's find the coordinations that are necessary for those songs what do you want to sing? How do you want to how do you want those sounds to sound? How do you want those songs to sound, right? So that isn't really like cross training necessarily. It's just like training. Mm -hmm. And it's student led. So yeah. And at the same time, saying that, I do love, I do again, I, I don't, I'm not mad at the at cross training as as a as a concept. I think, you know, <laughs> I think the intention is good. <laughs> We all know about good intentions. Uh, someone says, someone says, do we need to unlearn or just be flexible as singers? Could we consider techniques to be more interchangeable? Yeah, like I love that question because, and, and I think that the more we, the more we embrace the concept of like, we are training and we are finding options and we are working toward the options that will allow for this singer to do the kind of singing they want to do and use their voice in the way they want to use it, the less we have to think about, the fewer people will need to unlearn because the technique is already flexible. The voice is already flexible, right? Because the voice is already like, we already know what the options are. I already have all of these options within my, uh, you know, and, and then I start to understand where I apply what coordination for what tonal outcome, right? I start to sort of have that understanding. So then that becomes, I don't have to unlearn anything because I already have all the options. I already have access to those options. Voice teachers, myself included, often feel like the main goal is to transfer of information in the lesson. Oh yeah, mm -hmm. I need to teach you something that I know, but more and more I'm learning that it's only part of the lesson experience. I, Daniel, I would posit that it is um, in fact, not even part of the lesson experience. <laughs> so I've been having this talk quite a bit and uh, recently um, with, with lots of folks, actually folks in the voice pet undegree as well as, you know, in, in the zeitgeist like talking to people, um, just about the fact that like, we need to reevaluate our role as instructors, our role as teachers, our role as um, and, and, and how and what we are supposed to be doing in order to get our money, in order to earn our money, right? I, like, we need to reevaluate that. So if our, if our goal is to give the student what they need in order to be successful or in order to have a career or in order to prepare them for a career, like, if that's our goal, then everything we do will be based on what can I give to you, right? What can I, and, and so that's like totally teacher centric, right? That's like, what is my knowledge? What do I have to offer? And how can I like, how can I impart it to you? 
if our goal is actually to support agency and to support singers as they learn what their coordinations and options are and as they understand themselves um, and, and as they're able to, 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 to support singers in developing self-assessment tools, if that's our goal, then my, my, my main goal becomes not to transfer information in a lesson. My main goal then becomes to provide learning experiences so the student can get the information for themselves, right? This is, this is one of the things that we're talking about in the Voice Pet Undegree is learn over lecture. It's one of the things that we are you know, working to notice within and to work on in our teaching in, in the Undegree, where we're working toward as soon as I want to give some information or I want to tell a singer what happened or I want to like explain a thing, I'm going to just like do a little stop in my own head and I'm going to think, what are the ways, what are the questions I can ask, what are the directives I can give, what are the, how can I support the singer it is the least effective way to learn as I lecture. <laughs> um, <laughs> he who is talking is the person who is learning, as they say. <laughs> um, how can I support them to get to the learning themselves? The fact that I have the information and I have this learning and also that I have experienced these coordinations and that I understand these coordinations and that I do have a pretty good idea of what say a Western classical sound should be should be, etc. I mean, I have that. Okay, yes, we're having a class discussion. It's not just a lecture. Thank you. <laughs> I have, yes, I have all of that experience. And that's part of why I'm teaching is because I have it. But the more I can decenter myself as the learning fount of knowledge, <laughs> the and work toward leading toward the information and work toward supporting students discovering the information, the better. So I'm here to, you know, in that capacity, I'm here to, to um, help to reframe, perhaps. I'm here to validate and to then, you know, have the, have the discussion, basically, right? I'm here to have the discussion. And because I've got some good information and good experience going on, I may be able to then you know, support that discussion and find the validation and do all of those things in a way that someone who is not a trained singer or who is not a teacher will not be able to do. Um, yeah, someone said something, I never thought I was unlearning, but adding tools to our toolbox and learning more expansively. Yes, learning expansively. I love that. I love that idea. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, golly. Okay. I've been going for a while now, so I should probably like let that go, right? Let me just see. Coke inspires when I feel, oh, I'm so glad. I'm so glad. Yeah, that's a fun one, eh? Uh, I need a co-conspirator. Um, do we need to unlearn? Yeah, so, and I think to Sarah, just coming back to um, uh, Sarah Wilson, where you said something about there's also this dissonance uh, because students come to us as industry experts, right? And again, that I think is one of the things that needs that that I would love to see change. In that, yes, there are industry experts. Yes, there are folks who um, you know you can work with with folks to for a variety of reasons, and one of them can be because you, you think that, you know, this person is going to be able to open doors and or has the experience, you know, maybe they've sung Rosina, and maybe they're a very, um, you know, I'm going back to Western classical here, but maybe they're a very well-known Rosina, and so you want to study with them because you also want to sing Rosina, and so you want, right, so there's this, this, um, understanding of the reason that I'm going, the reason that I'm taking voice lessons with you in particular is because you happen to be an expert in some way or another, right? Um, or an industry 
expert and in, yeah, an expert in the industry in some way or another. Um, and that is valid, but I think, you know, I think that's valid at this point, but I also think that I would love to see that change where the reason I'm going to you as a singer, uh, uh, the reason I'm going to you as a teacher, excuse me, is because you know how to support me in achieving my goals. Not because you can tell me what to do to fit into the industry. You know how to support me in getting, doing what I want to do, right? Perhaps within the industry, perhaps you know how to play the game in the industry a little bit better, but I would love to see that change, right? Where I'm not, I'm not going to you because you can, you can tell me how to play the game. I'm going to you because you're going to support me so that I can, I can, I can smash the rules a little. And I can actually do things that I want to do rather than having to fit myself into the industry. So that, um, I would love to see that change. And I'm not sure when or how that's ever gonna change, right? Because we also have like, well, and especially in our academic institutions, as we've talked about lots before, our academic institutions, so often the folks who are teaching in our academic institutions in Western classical singing in particular, um, so often they're teaching because they had, um, you know, a singing career and um, that's fine. But it also means that we don't know whether you can actually teach. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> and so maybe what we need is to have like, you know, like I, I go I go to see someone who is a very famous Rosina and I go to see her to coach Rosina. I don't go to her for voice lessons, you know. <laughs> I go to her to coach that role. Oh. Um, rather than voice lessons, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I would love for that to be um, a change, but I'm not so sure that that is ever, I don't know. I don't, I don't have a lot of belief in the system that it's gonna be like changing anytime soon. <laughs> because there's still a really big thing about like, if you didn't have a career, then you couldn't possibly train someone to be a big, you know, to have a career. That's not the goal of teaching. The goal of teaching is not to prepare you for a career. <laughs> That's not my role. <laughs> my role is to help you figure out support, help support you as you figure out how to self-assess so that you can figure out how far along and what you need to do in order to have the career that you want. <laughs> okay. That's not my job. But I don't know if that's going to change or when. Let's keep talking about it. Maybe it will change. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe it will change a little bit. Maybe at some point it will change. Yep. And then we'll have like, we'll have educators, right? Yes, and being themselves. Yes, right. And then we'll then we'll start having educators who in in our academic academic systems who are like, hey, I know how this system works. Because I I I molded myself. I figured it out, and I you know I got in the system and I did the things that I needed to do to sing to you know to have the career I wanted in the system, and so I did that. But like, mm -hmm. yeah, so true. Yeah, yeah. Very often, you, the 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 teaching, whether or not you are a an effective teacher, is like the the lowest part, like the least important part. <laughs> Very often, the like most important part is whether or not you have a name, a recognizable name as a venue. Who knows whether you can teach or not. <laughs> Yes, I would love for all of us in independent voice teachers, in independent voice te studios, excuse me, to start to think of ourselves as the reason we're getting paid is not so that June and Jade and Jesse, all the J names, <laughs> um, can sing better. The reason we're getting paid, what parents are paying us for, and what adult amateur singers, etc., are paying us for, is for an experience of learning 
and an experience of agency, an experience of understanding ourselves that is transferable to so many other areas of life. And that's actually an educational goal. Students have experiences of learning that are transferable. <laughs> learning experiences that are transferable. That is the thing. I feel like it's a pride struggle if it will change because we will be asking those within the system to challenge the system 100%, Christy, yeah, 100%. We will be asking, yeah. I mean, that's what we're doing, right? We're asking the, the folks who are in the system and who are benefiting from it <laughs> to change it. As with all social movements, uh, you know, like this is, this is, this is there are so many intersections. I could talk about this all day, but maybe I should stop. Yeah, there's so many intersections, right? Very challenging to change the system when you are in it and benefiting from it. Ah. We're trying, I know Sarah's, Sarah's in the system. I'm also somewhat in the system. <laughs> I, teach a, I teach a class, yep, I know, trying. And there are lots of folks in the system who are trying. Woo, I've had so many great discussions with folks um, in academic systems talking about uh, um, taking grading out of juries and recitals and how do we like, how do we un, how do we, how do we ungrade? I am working with ungrading in my undergrad voice pen class. There are lots of things that are definitely percolating. Definitely. This thing of like <clears throat> hiring superstars to teach. <laughs> I'm not sure when or if that one's going to change, but there are definitely some other changes. Okay. Don't get me wrong. Some of the there are some terrific, wonderful teachers out there who had wonderful careers as well. Lots of them. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> and then there are, yeah. But also the system has to change, right? Like the students have to start to come into the system, not because they want to like study with superstar teacher who may or may not know how to teach, right? Or and or because they want to study with so and so because they're a really good technical teacher and or blah blah blah. They they need to we we want we want to change the system so that singers are coming into the system into schools and saying like uh I know what I want. Who can help me find the ways to get to what I want? Who's gonna not teach me how to get there, support me as I get there. All right. <laughs> Let's stop now, shall we? It's been an hour. All right, I will talk to y'all later. Have a great weekend. What are some of the ways that you are using the term classical or that you hear the term classical? Uh, you know, that you hear the like, that concept kind of thrown around. Yeah, yeah, you're welcome. Just like think about it. See what see what the see what that brings up for you, and also see what happens when you consider um, uh, what it means to train versus train in you know a specific way. How good? Okay, going now. <laughs> well, I went on Instagram. Let's go on Facebook too. Bye.